Some things are just made for each other, like fall and football, and like space exploration and high performance computing. Stay tuned because each of my next guests is from NASA. My name is Jordan Angel. I work at the Computational Aerosciences Branch in the NASA Advanced Supercomputing Division at NASA Ames Research Center. Hi, I'm Derek Daly, and I'm also in the Computational Aerosciences Branch at NASA Ames, and mostly work on aerodynamics for launch vehicles and, let's just say, develop database technologies. And I'm Francois Cadzier. Uh, I'm also a colleague of Jordan and Derek, uh, working at the uh, same branch in the same division and at NASA Ames as well. Um, I mainly work on uh, near-field acoustics for the uh, Orion Launch Abort System. Well, thank you. Thank you each for being with us. I know one of the hot topics is the Artemis mission. We're headed back to the moon, thanks to people like you. Uh, can you give us an idea of how it was specifically supporting that mission? Sure. So uh, a lot of my work focuses on uh, simulations of the launch environment. So um, a lot of the work that I work on is going to be simulating the ignition for SLS engines and their interaction with a uh, water-based sound suppression system, which is used to protect SLS from its own acoustic waves that it generates. So we try to use CFD and high-performance computing to increase mission safety and uh, reliability that way. Yeah, and for myself, I, I work on ascent aerodynamics, as we call it, which means most of the aerodynamics that happens between about 20 seconds after liftoff and booster separation, which is about two and a half minutes in. <clears throat> so that involves just like predicting things like will the cameras fall off the vehicle and how much aerodynamic load will be applied to the vehicle. And it also affects performance a little bit. And Francois. Yes, uh, I work on a system that we hope we never have to use. Um, it's a safety system that's meant to save the uh, astronauts in case something goes wrong during launch. Uh, this can happen at any time during, um, you know, on the, on the pad or during ascent, uh, all the way to when we reach the edge of space. Um, and so this uh, launch abort system is meant to pull the astronauts away from a potentially malfunctioning rocket um, and to, a way to safety. So. Uh, it's been very rewarding to um, do these uh, simulations to try and better understand the uh, distribution of um, vibrations that we can expect on the uh, uh, launch aboard vehicle structure and use that to ensure uh, the safety of the system. There's tons and tons of different teams, different, very minute sometimes aspects of the launch and the pre-launch and the aboard and coming back as entry, descent, landing, lots of teams. One uh, that doesn't go away until we actually have flown is a broadly called debris analysis. So if you remember what happened to Columbia, we definitely learned a few things about that. And it's virtually impossible to predict all the different types of debris that might be a problem. So that's something where even as, you know, there's a hour or several hours before launch, somebody may go out to the pad and, or with a camera, notice something on the vehicle. It's like, oh, there's like some ice where we didn't expect it. And that's something we're like, we, we may use supercomputing to predict, is that ice a problem even right before launch? So uh, speaking of the launch pad, can one of you talk about how a launch pad design is impacted by high performance computing? Sure, so I think I can say a bit on that, or at least part of my research is going to be, or my research is focused on um, estimating acoustic loads on the launch pad. So this is, when SLS starts, it uh, has powerful solid rocket boosters, right? When those fire, they generate uh, very strong acoustic waves that propagate underneath the mobile launch pad, right? And that pressure is felt on the underside of the pad. So a lot of the work that I've done is focused on simulating that ignition and the interaction of those plumes with the water-based sound suppression system. And then that uh, informs the kind of pressures that will be felt on the underside of the launch pad. And then we provide that information to design engineers so that they can uh, make sure that the pad is safe for use. Yeah, and I can add that there is CFD done on the launch pad itself, even without a rocket sitting on it, because um, you can imagine like this is hurricane weather 
could be any time of the year, right? And so we have a certain wind that we have to qualify the launch pad itself to. Uh, that CFD is done by a group at NASA Langley right now. This gets into this whole area of how when we are doing things for space exploration, we almost inevitably uh, impact daily life. Yeah, I, I think um, obviously the spinoffs from space flight have been so so uh, countless, basically. But um, like just think about everybody using GPS every second of their lives practically nowadays. But also, yeah, there's a lot of mundane everyday factors going the other way that could affect space flight. You don't think of like a big constraint for us on when we can launch to the moon is just wanting to have the first two launches in daylight. And you know, the moon is where it is. You can't just launch whenever you want. So you got two competing constraints there. Very simple things like has the sunset uh, can really complicate our lives. Can you help us put in perspective why supercomputing is so essential to this that uh, we just couldn't be doing the kinds of things that you're doing if we didn't have these incredibly high powered, uh, both uh, the supercomputing and the, the high performance networks that tie them all together? Smiling. That's an interesting perspective. I maybe maybe we could uh, even consider the fact that this was done without supercomputing in the past, right? We we have already been to the moon, um, so clearly there was expertise already developed in the forties, uh, fifties, um, and sixties, and seventies, and so on, where supercomputing wasn't available. I think that maybe the better question would be, what kinds of things are we enabling now that we have this capability? Um, and I think. Uh, as you've heard from all three of us, we're doing a lot more um, analysis up front um, than was than we would have been able to before. And some of that some of that analysis is informing um, the the flight tests and the ground tests that we're doing, and to the point where some of these um, ground and flight tests are less frequent than they were, for example, in the 50s and 60s, and perhaps then also reduce the overall cost of developing these new um, technologies for um, access to space. Um, so I think that's really where I see uh, these technologies impacting um, access to space is reducing potentially the uh, time to um, having a, a successful design and also potentially reducing the cost. And in, our, in my particular case, we've run uh, on the order of 20 um, large-scale CFD simulations to better understand the uh, vibration levels on the um, abort system and understand their implications for the structural uh, integrity of that system. And um, these simulations are uh, typically very large and take a, a significant amount of time of resources compared to um, our bread and butter um, steady CFD because these are unsteady time accurate simulations where we try to resolve uh, the small turbulent eddies that are impacting the, uh, the structure. Um, but I think my colleague, uh, Derek has done, uh, way more impressive in terms of number of simulations and can tell you more about how that's impacted the design of the SLS rocket, for example. Francois and I are kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum there where he has to do really big individual simulations. And then you can only do so many of them and hope you understand the whole flight regime. I tend to do like what's actually on an individual case pretty easy. Like I'll be using 400 nodes or 400 cores only, something like that. Pretty easy to do. But then I just finished a run matrix uh, with my team of six, uh, which involved, let me think, uh, over 15,000 cases. We were able to run that in two months. And each of those is really, really different, different meshes. So. It, Kind of like on an individual level, not impressive, but then you have to put the whole the whole story together. And I think that's actually a big part of how supercomputing comes in is you can really fine tune the kind of data you're getting for what's appropriate. Whereas, you know, you do a wind tunnel test or a flight test, there's some of that too, like which how big of a model do you build, that kind of thing. But you really can control like how much resources you have available and how many times you want to do it. And the thing that really is special about computing versus any kind of physical testing is 
it's not so much that your data is necessarily more accurate, but you get it everywhere. If you think about a flight test, if you want to know the pressure somewhere on the vehicle, you have to put a sensor there, right? Versus if you're using a computer simulation, that's automatic. You'll just know the pressure everywhere because that was needed as part of the simulation. So we get a lot of what I call high density data, density everywhere, or data everywhere on the vehicle. And you may lose some accuracy because it's not you know, a real flight test. It depends on how good your models are. But that's really the, the special aspect, I think, of supercomputing, in addition to just turnaround time. It's just like, how much data can you get? Like, you may be interested in the total drag on the rocket, but at the same time, you're going to learn about how much, how many pounds are being exerted on this little tiny camera hanging off the side. And I, one more thing I like to add is just going, kind of playing devil's advocate a little bit about how supercomputing has changed rocket engineering. Sometimes, just because it's there, uh, I've experienced it. You know, in my seven years working for the Space Launch System, where the senior managers will know that that capability is there, and then they'll assume that more analysis will solve your problem <laughs> rather than going back to square one like you might have done the Apollo era. Just because you you know you can survive with tight tolerances if you really know. Whereas back in the Saturn V, like especially for the early missions, it was super overpowered, really strong vehicle because they had to. There was no way. I mean, you didn't know how very accurately what you were going to see in flight. So you had to overbuild the vehicle. And that's how the theory of uh, modern computational assets is supposed to make launch vehicles better, where you know they're lighter, they're stronger, because you don't have to overbuild. Well, Derek, Francois, Jordan, thank you so much for being with us on this edition of SC21 TV.